you were ready whenever we're ready whenever you are. Okay, thank you. For <laughs> thank you all for coming this afternoon. Um, my program is called the Passengers of the Mayflower and are you a descendant? And um, I'd like to thank the library for inviting me to present this program on the Mayflower Pilgrims, their history, and the tools you can use to find out whether you are one of the more than 35 million descendants of the Mayflower Pilgrims worldwide. And I will begin with the history of the Pilgrims. The passengers of the Mayflower who arrived in Plymouth Harbor in 1620 are sometimes referred to as saints and strangers. The saints are the separatist group who separated from the Church of England and then fled to the Netherlands in 1608 to escape persecution after they were discovered meeting in secret at the manor house in Scrooby, England, home of postmaster William Brewster. Separating from the Church of England was a radical and dangerous move because the King of England was the head of the church and everyone was required to attend the Church of England. And on this slide, you will see a list of the families who were considered to be saints, and then another list of the families on the Mayflower who were considered to be the strangers. The group often referred to as the strangers are part of a London group who left England for economic reasons to start a new life or related to a member of the separatist group. Since most of the members of the London group were not known to the separatists, they are often referred to as the strangers. And you can see uh, which families uh, were divided between these two groups. Once the Mayflower arrived in America, the saints and strangers were one group and all are considered pilgrims. As I mentioned earlier, the separatists fled to the Netherlands and lived there for 12 years. They chose the Netherlands because of its tolerance, which it is still known for today. It is in this culture they learned to live and communicate with people who spoke a different language and different ways of living. This experience prepared them for their next adventure, America. The separatists decided to leave Leiden, Netherlands, after about 12 years because their children were speaking Dutch and losing their English identity. And there was also concern about a war between the Netherlands and Spain and what would happen if Spain were victorious. The separatists always felt an allegiance to England, despite their opposition to the Church of England. After much consideration, they decided to petition the Virginia Company for a patent to establish a new colony in America, which was eventually approved by King James. The separatist group chose from their flock the youngest and strongest with special skills for establishing the colony. They also purchased a 60-ton ship named the Speedwell and hired a crew and master who agreed to stay one year in America. The Speedwell was going to be used for fishing along the coast and, if necessary, get them back to England. 67 passengers left Delft Haven, Holland, on July 22, 1620, on the Speedwell, while their entire congregation was present to see them off. Just before departure, Pastor John Robinson and those on the Speedwell fell to their knees as a prayer was given for them as depicted in this beautiful painting. There were lots of tears shed as families were being separated. The Speedwell headed for Southampton, England to meet up with the Mayflower and its passengers for their departure to America on August 5th, 1620. After two failed attempts, to leave for America because the Speedwell leaked profusely. The group decided to leave the Speedwell behind and crowded 12 of the 35 passengers from the Speedwell onto the Mayflower. The Speedwell had been fitted with two larger masts under the supervision of the crew. When the masts are too tall, they can cause the hull to leak. Bradford later thought that the overmasting of the Speedwell might have been done on purpose by the master of the Speedwell for fear of starving to death in America. At any rate, the Speedwell was sold, refitted, and made many voyages thereafter. But the pilgrims continued on to America with no backup ship 
and very late in the year because of all the delays encountered with the speed well. Vital funds were wasted on repairing the speed well, and there was concern there would only be a month worth of provisions left when the Mayflower arrived in America, too late to plant a crop until the next spring. After a month of delays, the Mayflower left Plymouth, England on September 6, 1620, with 102 passengers for the 66-day voyage to America. The passengers consisted of 50 adult men, 19 adult women, and 33 children, of which 19 were under the age of 13. Three of the women were pregnant, Elizabeth Hopkins, Mary Norris Allerton, and Susanna White. There was also the crew, which included a doctor named Giles Hale, and let's not forget that Mayflower also carried several chickens, goats, two dogs, a mastiff, and a spaniel, and most likely a few cats. As depicted in this picture, the Mayflower was a cargo ship and usually transported wines, so there were no passenger rooms and very little privacy for the families. It was rare for women and children to be on ships of the during the 17th century. The Mayflower was approximately 90 feet long by 20 feet wide, with about five feet of headroom between the decks of the ship. It was large for that time period. This picture depicts how the Mayflower might have looked with the pilgrims on board. It would have been a bit crowded. Except for the pleasant weather of the first two weeks of the voyage, the Mayflower was in very stormy weather, and during one particularly bad storm, the main beam of the ship broke, and it was repaired with a large screw jack the passengers had on the Mayflower to use in the construction of homes. Without that repair, the Mayflower would have had to turn back to England and possibly have sunk in the ocean. In addition to the rough weather, the Mayflower passengers were in constant conflict with the crew of the Mayflower, who disliked their Bible reading and hymn singing and taunted them and used profanity. But the pilgrims proved their exceptional aptitude for establishing friendships, even under extreme provocation, and eventually the crew and the pilgrims were friends. During the voyage, the passengers were mostly cold and wet, and unable to bathe or wash their clothes. One passenger, John Howland, fell overboard during an especially violent storm. He was miraculously able to grab a hold of the topsail halyards, which hung overboard, and hung on until he was pulled back up to the brim of the water and then back in the ship with a boat hook and other means by the crew of the Mayflower. He was one lucky young man, and so are his descendants. On the voyage across the ocean, a baby ocean as Hopkins was born. The other two babies were born after arriving in America. Peregrine White was the first white child born in New England, and the Allerton baby was stillborn. One passenger and one crewman died during the voyage and were buried at sea. The first sight of land was Cape Cod, and a Pilgrim Memorial stands in Provincetown, Massachusetts. The new colony was to be in the northern part of the Virginia colony, south of the 41st parallel near, near the Hudson River, but the Mayflower ended up further north because of the rough seas and could not make it to its intended destination. Since they were now going to be establishing their colony outside of any established governmental jurisdiction, a document known as the Mayflower Compact was authored by the passengers and signed by the men to establish a rule of law in the new colony and to keep the group together. The Mayflower Compact is a unique document because it established self-government in America for the first time and is considered to have set the stage for the Constitution of the United States of America. It was signed as the Mayflower was anchored here in the inside arm of Cape Cod. Cape Cod was where the first, where the passengers first drank fresh water here in this area where springs are located. They had their first encounter with Native Americans um, here on this beach. Also on Cape Cod, they found um, they found buried corn, which they dug up and kept 
most of which was kept to plant the next spring. The pilgrims later made arrangements to repay the Native Americans for the corn they took. Corn Hill today is owned by the General Society of Mayflower Descendants. The Mayflower eventually sailed around the inside arm of Cape Cod as the passengers searched for a suitable place to establish their colony. They finally found the right place when they arrived at what is now known as Clement, but known then by the Native Americans as Patuxent and had been home to a tribe of Native Americans who had all died of disease in 1617. In addition to being uninhabited, this area had a stream fed by fresh springs and the right type of terrain. The stream is known as Town Brook and never goes dry even during a drought. And this is one of the springs that feeds Town Brook. The first structure built by the pilgrims was a 20 by 20 foot common house. The Mayflower remained anchored in the harbor for the winter as shelter was being built and returned to England on April 1st, 1621. So it was in harbor there at Plymouth for about um, five, four to five months. Half of the Mayflower passengers died the first winter of the great sickness. The dead were quietly buried at night on what is now known as Cole's Hill, so the Native Americans would not know their numbers were dwindling. Over the years, rain and excavation exposed the bones of the Mayflower passengers buried here, and the remains were gathered and eventually put in this sarcophagus with the names who died the first winter. Of those that died the first winter, the pilgrims lost 75% of their women, 50% of their men, 38% of the boys, and surprisingly, only 11% of the girls. Four adult women out of the 19 who boarded the Mayflower lived to the first Thanksgiving. Plymouth Colony was the first colony settled by families rather than just men like Jamestown. And unlike Jamestown, the Pilgrims made a peace treaty with the Native Americans that lasted about 50 years. The first Native American who very boldly walked into Plymouth Settlement on March 16, 1621, was named Samoset. He saluted and enthusiastically proclaimed, Welcome Englishmen in English. Samoset was from a part of Maine frequented by English fishermen from whom he learned English. Two of the most important Native Americans to the Pilgrims were Massasoit, Sanctum of the Poconopets, and his interpreter, Squanto, who spoke English from spending many years as a captive in Europe. Squanto was a member of the Patuxent tribe whose former summer village was located on the site where, where Plymouth is located. It was also Squanto who taught the Pilgrims to plant corn and to fertilize the corn with dead fish taken from Town Brook. Town Brook fills with herring each spring, still to this day, coming back to where they were born to spawn and then return to the ocean. These herring in turn bring a lot of whales off the shores of Cape Cod who feed on the herring. Their surviving Mayflower passengers were able to build additional shelter, raise a crop, and forge an alliance with the Native Americans. When fall arrived, the Pilgrims held a harvest feast with the Native Americans, which we now refer to as the first Thanksgiving, which was 401 years ago. In November 1621, one year after their arrival in Plymouth, a ship appeared on the horizon. They feared it was French and took up arms, but to their delight, it was English. The fortune sent by the adventurers with 37 passengers. Some of those who arrived on the fortune were friends and family members of the Mayflower Pilgrims. That is how the first year played out for the Mayflower Pilgrims. Much of what we know about the voyage and the early years in Plymouth Colony were documented by William Bradford in his manuscript, Plymouth Plantation. There was also a publication called Mort's Relation in which Pilgrim Edward Winslow provided a short description of the first Thanksgiving. This is a photo of a replica of Plymouth Colony at Plymouth Patuxent Museums. The Pilgrims called this First Street, and it is lined with the replicas of the Waddle and Dog houses they built. You will note at the very end of the street is the Fort Meeting House, 
but the meeting house being on the first floor, which is where they held their church services. This is a present day picture of that original street and it is now known as Leiden Street. The homes along the street have placards which tell which Pilgrim home had been located on that particular site. You will notice there is a church at the end of the street near where the Fort Meeting House had been located. This is the fifth church meeting house on this location with the Fort Meeting House being the first. It is the first church in America and the longest continuous operating church in America. The current church building was built and dedicated in 1899 as a memorial to the pilgrim and contains Tiffany stained glass windows and a bell in the belfry that was first cast by Paul Revere. The last mm -hmm. congregation of this church did not have funds to maintain the building and asked the General Society of Mayflower descendants if they would take ownership and maintain it. After all, who would love it more than the Mayflower Pilgrim descendants? So this building, along with its church records, are now owned by the General Society of Mayflower Descendants and is known as the National Pilgrim Memorial Meeting House, or simply the Mayflower Meeting House, and it will become an educational center. This is a multi-million dollar project to repair and renovate this building. The General Society of Mayflower Descendants now has a place where it can tell the pilgrim story. External renovations to the meeting house are complete. Phase one of the interior projects will be complete with the installation of, will, will begin with the installation of an elevator, which is in progress. Other phases will begin as funds allow. One, one interior project is the restoration of the tin bell chimes of the Carolyn, and the restoration cost for each one of these bells is $15,000. 2020 was the year the Mayflower descendants had been anticipating for years to commemorate the 400th anniversary of the Voyage of the Mayflower. The Mayflower Society kicked off 2020 with the Voyage of Hope 1620 float and the Tournament of Roses Parade on January 1, 2020, spearheaded by the California Mayflower Society. The, May the Voyage of Hope 1620 float was given the honor of being the third float in the lineup for the parade and won the award Americana for the most outstanding depiction for national treasures and traditions. Then COVID struck and most and all of the 400th anniversary events were canceled. The highlight of the General Society's 2020 Congress via Zoom for Kansas was the election of Jane Hurt of Lenexa, Kansas as a new governor general for the 2020-2023 term, becoming the highest ranking author of the General Society a worldwide nonprofit organization with over 30,000 members. Governor General Hurt is the first Kansas member to serve in such capacity. The U.S. Post Office in 2020 released a new forever postage stamp commemorating the 400th anniversary, and it is called Mayflower in Plymouth Harbor. The Mayflower Society House and the gardens were spruced up to commemorate the 400th anniversary with the house uh, being painted and shrubs replaced with pink and white flowers. The Mayflower Society House is currently undergoing multi-million dollar renovation that will be completed by next September when the Mayflower Society members descend on Plymouth for the 43rd Congress. <laughs> One of the most iconic symbols of the voyage of the Mayflower is a replica of the Mayflower. Ship Mayflower was built in the United Kingdom and sailed to the United States in 1957 as a gift to the American people for their support and friendship during World War II. Plymouth Patuxent Museums agreed to maintain and exhibit the ship, which is now over 60 years old. Mayflower was in Mystic, Connecticut from 2016 until the summer of 2020, almost four years, for an $11.2 million restoration to make it ready for 2020 events, which unfortunately did not occur. Ship Mayflower left Mystic Seaport in July of 2020 to much fanfare, then spent a couple of weeks in New London, Connecticut for sea trials where it was invited to sail with the United States Coast Guard Brock Eagle in Block Island Sound on July 30th. Then on Monday, August 10th, 2020, Mayflower made its final leg home to Plymouth Harbor with even more fanfare. 
Many personal watercrafts accompanied Mayflower on this final leg home or waited in Plymouth Harbor with many spectators lining the shoreline. The GSMB General Board of Assistants authorized the commission of this seated and thoughtful William Bradford statue. Sculptor and Mayflower descendant B. Clemens created the statue at his studio in Loveland, Colorado. At the beginning, Mr. Clemens asked for photographs from GSMB male members directly descended from William Bradford so he could look for shared facial features to use in his depiction of William Bradford's face. And the Bradford statue was moved to Plymouth in the summer of 2021, where it was dedicated in the Mayflower Society House Gardens. Also during the 2021 GBOA meeting events, GSMD commemorated the 400th anniversary of the first Thanksgiving with a dinner at Plymouth Patuxent Museums with the food prepared as it would have been prepared in the 17th century with the guests being given only a knife and spoon to eat with, no fork. The food was served family style by pilgrim actors dressed in pilgrim 17th century clothing and speaking with a 17th century dialect. And here is a, a list of some of the food we enjoyed. And it was a very interesting event. And um, the food was quite different from what we eat today. So now we're going to move on to finding your Mayflower ancestor. That many. So here's a list of the Mayflower passengers from whom lineage has been proved. One of the first clues as to whether you might be a Mayflower descendant would be if you find one of these surnames in your ancestry and if you have family lines that go back to New England. In my own case, the Mayflower surlines were lost within a few uh, generations. Typically, if you find one Mayflower family in your lineage, you will find several. It is now easier than ever to find your connection to a Mayflower passenger. And here are some of the research tools that can help you, which include the Mayflower Society Silver Books and website, GSMD Partnerships, a Patriot to Passenger List, and the Mayflower Lineage Match. And we will start with the Silver Books. The General Society of Mayflower Descendants publishes a set of books called the Mayflower Families, or more commonly referred to as the Silver Books because of their color. The Silver Books document the first five and more generations for each of the Mayflower passengers. Each volume of the Silver Books is dedicated to a particular Mayflower passenger. Some passengers with a large number of descendants have several books dedicated to the documentation of their descendants. Each volume has an index of names, but a new Silver Books index directory is in the work that will encompass all of the indices from each book into one master volume named MF1 Silver Book Index Directory and will be published soon. The index can be researched for family names. The genealogical in information in these books has been meticulously investigated by the General Society and the pages from these books is all that is needed as proof of the first five and more generations from the Mayflower passengers. The Silver Books are available for purchase from the General Society website, where you can find sets of these books in large libraries. I believe there are a few here in the Topeka Library and also at the Kansas Historical Society Library here in Topeka. And there's a brand new set at the Topeka Genealogical Society Library in Topeka, to name a few. There is another great way to search the information for the fifth and sixth generations published in the Silver Books. The General Society partnered with the New England Historic Genealogical Society, often referred to as NEGS, to make a searchable database of the fifth and sixth generation descendants from the Silver Books. This database is available on AmericanAncestors.org and can be searched by name. When using advanced search, go to the drop down box for databases and choose Mayflower Families Fifth Generation Descendants. Search the names of your ancestors who were born between 1700 and 1840. 
If you find an ancestor in this database, it will give you the rest of the line to your Mayflower passenger. You can also go to mayflower.americanancestors.org and you will find several Mayflower databases at this site, including a database consisting of information from the GSMD approved applications. The General Society has also partnered with NAGS and Family Search, where Family Search has digitized uh, many of the approved GSMD membership applications and created a search name index. So no one's information born in the last hundred years is being published, and Family Search updates these records every five years. The records are digitized for quicker access and are being made available on NAGS and Family Search to generate more knowledge of possible. Mayflower Ancestry. And of course, Family Search is um, a free database that you can access easily. Another exciting GSMD partnership is the Family Tree DNA and a Family Tree DNA Mayflower project. There are 26 Mayflower families with descendants, and the Y DNA and MT DNA have been identified for a number of the male and female passengers. The Mayflower Society is in the process of updating its standards and guidelines for using DNA to prove lineage, including auto, autosomal DNA for the first three generations only. More information on this will be available in the near future. Also, the DNA committee is working to identify the Happel groups of the Mayflower passengers, and a list of those Happel groups by Mayflower passengers is available on the Mayflower Society website in the members only section. DNA tests can be added to the Mayflower Project and Family Tree DNA from a variety of different DNA test sites. Family Tree lets family lets people know when they when their DNA test shows a match with a DNA with a Mayflower passenger, so that person can seek information regarding the Mayflower Society if they are interested. And the next tool in the box is the Patriot to Passenger list. The Mayflower Society has established a Patriot to Passenger Bridge project. Many members of the sons and daughters of the American Revolution are tracing their Patriots lineage back to the Mayflower. A growing published list of Patriots who are descendants of the Mayflower is available on the General Society webpage under Explore Your Roots tab. This list was started in an effort to grow a bridge between the SAR and DAR organizations and the Mayflower Society. There are roughly 150 years between the arrival of the Mayflower and the start of the American Revolution. So we're talking approximately five to six generations from a patriot on back to the Mayflower. With the silver books documenting the first five to sometimes six and more generations down from the Mayflower passenger, there could be little documentation gathering that needs to be done if your patriot is a descendant of the Mayflower, because you will have already gathered uh, the documentation there necessary on the generations from yourself to, the, to your patriot to join SAR or DAR. This patriot list is alphabetized and includes the birth, marriage, and death information available for the patriot and the names of the ancestors from the patriot to the Mayflower passenger. This list is 410 pages long with about 10 patriots to each page. I hope you find it includes one of your ancestors. Last but not least is the Mayflower lineage match. Once you know your Mayflower line and the names of the ancestors in each generation, you can complete the General Society's Mayflower lineage match. You can do this online or by snail mail and the cost is $75. This is not an application, and you do not need to do a Mayflower lineage match for, for other family members who share the same Mayflower line. You complete the form by starting with the Mayflower passenger at the top, working your way down each generation, adding the name of the son or daughter from the previous generation and their spouse until you get to yourself. Then submit the form to the General Society who will review the line to see if it partially matches an approved application already on file with the Mayflower Society. If an approved application is found that closely follows your line, then depending on the age of the application, you will 
Submit documentation from yourself to your closest common ancestor on the approved application. This will save you time and money. Documentation requirements have changed over the years, so depending on how old the approved application is, you might be asked to submit additional documentation to bring the application up to today's requirement standards. Kansas Society membership information. When you have found your Mayflower ancestor, membership in the Mayflower Society is made through the member societies like the Society of Mayflower Descendants in the state of Kansas and includes membership in the General Society of Mayflower Descendants. The membership dues for the Kansas Society are $18 per year and the General Society dues are $35 for a total of $53 payable each December 15th to the Kansas Society. To begin the application process, the Kansas Society sends a preliminary application to prospective members, which is essentially contact information. The preliminary application is completed and then returned to the corresponding secretary with the non-refundable application fee of $198. The corresponding secretary then sends the preliminary application to the Kansas historian who contacts a prospective member to begin and assist the prospective member through the process of completing and submitting the official lineage application. The Kansas Society has over 400 members and meets twice a year with a spring luncheon and our annual Mayflower Compact Luncheon meeting in November. The meetings are typically held in the Kansas City area, Wichita, and Topeka. And we just held our Mayflower Compact meeting last Sunday, and our guest speaker was a costume role player from Plymouth Patuxent Museum in Plymouth playing the role of Mary Brewster, one of only four women who survived to the, through the first year. And she presented a program on the religion of the pilgrims. Future meetings will be on our website, www.ksmayflower.org. The General Society of Mayflower Descendants was established in 1897 to join together people who share the lineage of the pilgrims and to carry on their memory. The Mayflower Society is celebrating its 125th anniversary this year. The General Society of Mayflower Descendants consists of 54 member societies including a member society in each of the 50 states and societies in Washington, D.C., Canada, Europe, and Australia, with a total of approximately 30,000 members. Representatives of these 54 member societies meet annually as the General Board of Assistants or at the Triannual Congress held in Plymouth every three years. These meetings provide an opportunity to meet other members from around the world, as well as take care of the business of the General Society. The General Society headquarters in Plymouth is located on a campus with the Edward Winslow House built in 1754 by the great grandson of Mayflower passenger Edward Winslow. This prestigious house is almost 300 years old and is a short stroll up Coles Hill from Plymouth Rock and the harbor. The house was purchased by the General Society in 1941 and became the Mayflower Society House. There is a staff of approximately 20 at Mayflower headquarters to handle the daily operations of the organization, which includes the verification of, of membership applications. The Mayflower Library is also located on the campus and is open Monday through Friday, except holidays. The General Society hosts virtual lecture series each month via Zoom. These programs are free and open to the public and cover topics on pilgrim-related matters and colonial history. A link for each lecture is on the Mayflower Society page, www.themayflowersociety.org. On the home page, you just scroll down and click on lecture series. The next lecture series is on Monday, May 21st from 1 to 2 Central Time, and the topic is the Winslow family in Plymouth Colony. And then on Tuesday, December 13th from 6 to 7 p.m. Central Time, you can enjoy a lecture on King Philip's War. <clears throat> and on Thursday, January 26th, from 6 to 7 p.m. Central Time, the lecture will be The Pilgrims and Americans' War Over Its History. And there are very interesting lectures already lined up for all of 2023. Also, the General Society website under the tab Exploring Your Roots 
are several genealogy webinars for, for both members and the public that cover getting started with genealogy, deciphering what your ancestor wrote, using census records, vital records and introduction, using secondary records, and finally application do's and don'ts. And those are all uh, educational type webinars. And again, they're all open to the public and can be accessed under Exploring Your Roots on the General Society website. When you're interested, if you're interested in applying for membership to the General Society and the Kansas Society, your, doc, your application includes documentation from yourself back to your Mayflower passenger. The birth, marriage, and death documentation needs to be provided for each generation from yourself to your Mayflower passenger, including the spouses of those ancestors in your direct Mayflower line. If you are able to tag on to an already approved application of either a family member or when you have been matched up with your Mayflower lineage match, you will only need to submit documentation to your closest ancestor on that approved application unless you need to submit additional documentation to bring it up to today's standards. And the documentation also needs to provide information that connects the generations together and to prove birth, marriage, and death dates and the places where these events occurred. Birth, marriage, and death certificates must be provided for at least the first three generations from yourself to your grandparents as filed with the state vital statistics office or at the county level. If birth, marriage, and death, certificate, death certificates are available for any subsequent generation, these records should be used whenever possible. They are considered primary sources, and you only need one primary source to document a date or place. You need two secondary sources to uh, document places and relationships. And so you saw a list of the primary sources, and this is a list of some of the secondary uh, sources. I'm sure you're uh, familiar with newspaper obituaries, marriage accounts, uh, the federal and state census, and uh, family genealogy, county and town histories, which are always nice when you can find those to help out to prove uh, your lineage. I will be available at the Mayflower uh, table and exhibit hall if you would like to visit with me later. I have a copy of the Patriot to Passenger list, list with me. And I also have a subscription to NEGS if you'd like to put in any ancestors name to the NEGS database to see if you have a line to the Mayflower. I will end with a quote from William Bradford, as one small candle may light a thousand, so the light here kindled hath shown unto many, yea, in some sort to a whole nation. And I would be happy to answer any questions you might have. So if I submitted and I'm working on my lineage, can I go then onto the MayflowerSociety.org website as a member since I'm not a member yet, am I? You would have to, your, your application would need to be approved and you would need to be assigned a, a general society and state membership number. That's when you're considered a member, so when you have those membership numbers. So this information isn't available just to the average public? If it's under the members, the web, there's a lot of information on the Mayflower Society that is available to the public. And okay. Explore Your Roots is one of those areas that's open to the public. If there's a tab that says members only, and that's the only part that you would not have access to. Mm -hmm. So you can access the lectures and those genealogy websites, webinars, and anything else on the website, just not the members only section. And then you have the Patriots of Passengers, as you said, here today. I have it with me, and it is also on the Mayflower Society website under Explore Your Roots. And that takes you back to the Revolutionary War? Yeah, the Patriots are um, S-A-R and E-A-R Patriots that have been, uh, their lineage has been proven to go back to the Mayflower Society. So if you have an ancestor in that Patriot to Passenger list, um, that list will give you the rest of the lineage back to the Mayflower, and it's alphabetized. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you all for coming today. And I hope hope you're interested in uh, submitted ap application. And if you need help with uh, any of your documentation or have questions, you can always contact us 
at the top top of the sheet I sent around. There's an info.kansasmayflower.org uh, email that you can use to uh, submit any questions if you have any any questions. That goes to our corresponding secretary. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And Mike, Mike mentioned that it, it, our library, Big Jimmy Yellowsville Society Library, we have all those silver books and everything there. And, and also that red book, I, I don't, that's kind of hard to understand, but we have the, you know, the and we don't charge anything. You just come in and sign the thing saying I was here. And that was it. But we have all those. It's a, it's a pretty new set too. So yeah, I guess it's, a, it's, a, it's a good. That, I think we have the six. Let's do the red book. Well, so the red book. Let's say you go through all this yeah. and you're okay. So you pay the 53 for the year and you pay the 198 for the year. The 198 is a one time fee for uh, to verify the application because a lot of that expense uh, goes to the verifiers for the, the verifiers that are professionals that work back in Plymouth. And then it also covers uh, $53 of that covers the first year dues that the application is approved. So if you were to put in an application in January and it would be approved in July, you would already have your dues paid through, through the end of the year. Ooh. So that's what part of that $198. But that's a one-time fee. After that, the next year, it's just the $53 each year for the dues. What if you, what if you stayed in it for five years and then you decided not to? Well, you could drop your membership and not pay the dues. Um, and then if, if five years down the line, you decided that you wanted to re uh, reinstate your membership, uh, there's a, a $10 reinstatement fee, plus you pay that current year's dues and, and one year's due, the prior year's dues. So you'd be paying two years due, the current years and the previous years, and the $10 reinstating fee. But you wouldn't have to go through all of it. That application um, again. So that would be like $106, but yeah, to reinstate if you if if the membership were dropped for a few years. Okay. But it would still stay in the records. So. Yes, those records will be will be kept forever. And that's one good thing if you want to um, do the application is you're documenting that lineage for for your family for all time. It will be kept by the General Society of Make Water Descendants. In their in their vault, and it'll be there for grandchildren and great grandchildren. Just a weird question. Like I've got a family, I've gotten the lineage down like six generations. I, I'm that's already been proven, so I don't have to do it. So I'm going up. Is there any contact between people that have done the work to, like this one family has the Bible? I, I've read where they've got the Crippen family Bible, and I think I could find my guy. <laughs> Where would you go start talking? I mean, I well, there's no, there's no contact. You. you know, if you're tagging on to somebody's old application, mm -hmm. you know, you don't you don't see their right. You don't see the current information. You know, down that would be blacked out. So there wouldn't be any contact there to preserve their privacy. Right. Um. So I don't know how you would go about contacting them unless they happen to be on ancestry and there's yeah. some way to mess with them or something. Oh, yeah. Okay, thank you. The Red Book. Oh, the, the Red Book. Are you familiar with the Red Book? I don't believe I am. Well, it, it has all, everybody who is related, it's about this thick and it, they're they're related by a number and it shows you, you go to this person, it'll show who their father was and you go to that person and it'll show who his father was and who his wife was, and she may have been a passenger, and it would have like or an M on there it means they were a passenger, and, and then it'll show their children, and it's kind of hard to read because you have to go back and forth, but we do have it. Mm -hmm. And and I'm still getting used to it. And I've been <laughs> looking at it for years. Mm -hmm. What are your hours? Well, um, you know, I can't I, I work there Saturday, I mean Wednesdays. Uh, from one to four, mm -hmm. so I know that I know those hours are okay, but I can't remember. I think we're closed on Monday, but we have our a booth downstairs at yeah. uh, the table, and they've got all the hours. Yeah. And there's always somebody there to help you. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and we have some computers you can get on and look and stuff like that. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.
Thank you. I'm going to get that paperwork in, though. Okay, I'm counting on you. Okay. <laughs> which, which line are you? Four. Four. Okay. Yeah. How about you others? Which which line? Sold. Sold. Okay. also like mine is yeah. Rogers. Well, but maybe I did. When I contacted this side, it said you also. You probably did it because you laid it this one.